All right, let's get into the Word of God as we continue in our, in our series. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 27. The Bible says that David thought to himself, one of these days I will be destroyed by the hand of Saul. Did you all catch the certainty of that? One of these days I will be destroyed by the hand of Saul. The best thing that I can do is to escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me anywhere in Israel and I will slip out of his hand. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you so much for the opportunity for us to study your word tonight. We just, today, we, we, just, we just look for a special blessing. This morning, we ask for you to pour out a blessing that we do not have room to receive it. We want to hear and be challenged by your word. We want to see and, and understand your word. Father, we want to be confronted with the things of our own nature, our own heart, our own character that need to be worked on. Father, do that in this special moment. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say <clears throat> amen and amen. So I asked you to notice the certainty. David said, one day Saul will kill me. He will. Now we know from the very beginning of this journey going through the life of David that David was anointed to be the future king of Israel, right? And it seemed from the very beginning that David operated from a place of deep conviction and faith. How is it that by chapter 27, David has now lost a bit of his faith? Some might even say all of his faith. To the point where he no longer trusts that God will be his refuge. He no longer trusts that God will be his deliverer. That he no longer trusts that God will be his protector. And now, looking at the Psalms, looking at his greatest hit list, it looks like it's all a bunch of lies. Because in this very moment, it is very clear that David does not have enough faith to continue with God as his shepherd and leader. He says, the best thing for me to do is to run to the Philistines. And we already know who the Philistines are. They are the greatest rivalry of Israel up to this point. This goes all the way back to the book of Judges when Samson, remember the superhero-like figure who took out the Philistines. This has gone on for decades. And now David is running to the enemy. This is, this is, this is like... This is like somebody from the 49ers going to play for the Oakland Raiders back in the day. This is like the Lakers and the Clippers exchanging players, right? Westbrook going from the Lakers to the Clippers. It doesn't, doesn't seem right. I mean, we were glad he's gone, but still, it didn't seem right. <laughs> there's, certain, there's certain teams that just do not mix well. There's, there's, certain, there's certain groups that throughout history just don't mingle. And the Philistines and the Israelites were one of those, 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 those I guess we saw heated rivalries that you could never see one of their champions going from one side in free agency to the other side. But here is David now deciding he's going to leave his contract with the Israelites and now play for the Philistines. The best thing for me to do is to run to the Philistines. Now, last week we talked about how he went there the first time, and it didn't work out so well. They noticed him. They said, aren't you the one where they sing the song, Saul has killed his thousands, but David is ten thousands? David became so afraid that he began to act like a madman, and they sent him away. But this is what sin does to us. The Bible calls it the mystery of iniquity. We just keep making some really poor decisions, even after we've experienced the consequences of similar poor decisions, we go back to the well and do it again, as if we're smarter this time around, right? That was last time. This time's going to be different. I'm going to go in with a little bit more swag this time. I'm going to stand up straight and I'm going to look King Achish in the eye and tell him it's a, it's a new era. And that's exactly what happens. King Achish, one of the five kings of Philistia, befriends David and says, hey man, I'm going to give you your own 
personal town in our area. He gave him the town called Ziklag, where David and 600 of his soldiers, his men, and their families could live the rest of their days. David was willing to give up on the anointing that God had placed on him, the future that God had already prophesied in his life. David was willing to give that up for what? Now some would say because he was afraid. But I don't believe it was just fear. I believe it was something else that inspired David to do this. And that's what the subject is for today. I believe that David was angry with God. I believe he was angry with God, he was angry with Saul, he was angry with some of the Israelites that were hunting him down like he were an animal. And David's anger got the best of him. And the reason why I believe that it was anger, it's because what David chooses to do within the first weeks of living in, in, in the town of Ziklag. The Bible tells us in chapter 27 that he began to raid nearby towns and villages. Read with me, verse 11, chapter 27, verse 11. It says, he did not leave a man or woman alive to be brought to Gath, for he thought they might inform on us and say, this is what David did. And such was his practice. As long as he lived in Philistine territory, Achish trusted David and said to himself, he has become so obnoxious to his people, the Israelites, that he will be my servant for how long? For life. Now, just in case you are tempted to think this was just one weekend in Vegas where he lost his mind, the Bible tells us he lived in Ziklag for 16 months. 16 months he was cut off from his family, his brothers, his father. For 16 months he was cut off from Saul. And here's the thing, he was protected. Saul didn't go searching for him. Saul wasn't going to mess with him while he was in Philistine territory. So it seemed like the plan had worked. And here is the problem with unchecked anger. We will begin to justify everything because the what justifies the what. What's the saying? The what? In justifies the means, right? So the end goal was that he would be protected. So it didn't matter what he had to do in order to accomplish such an end. And so this is the problem. David is actually killing innocent people, women and children, because he thought to himself, according to patriarchs and prophets from one of our favorite authors, he believed he was doing the will of God, getting rid of... Can you imagine that? Innocent people who had done nothing to you, and you justify that they're deserving of death because oh, they're just Philistines. David was stealing from them, taking their possessions, making himself wealthy while he lived in Zeklag, and making sure that there were no survivors to tell on him. In other words, when, when King Achish showed up and said, bro, where'd you get that new 8K television, man? We gonna watch the Super Bowl together? He's like, oh man, I was just a special at uh, Best Buy, that's all. He wasn't going to admit that he stole it. He wasn't going to admit that he killed anyone to get it. King Achish kept showing up going, bro, you are blessed, man. Look at it. I'm just, this whole entire town is flourishing. Where are you guys getting all this wealth? You know, the Lord is good. But don't we do the same thing when we're angry? We will justify everything. Well, you made me upset. How many times we've heard that excuse? Well, you made me angry. In other words, you deserve my wrath. You deserve what I'm saying to you. You deserve what I'm about to do to you because you made me mad. Most of us have our go-to ways of expressing our anger. And there's four types. There's four types. There's the, the very popular passive-aggressive way of expressing your anger. I can't stand when people do that. They say something really disparaging about you, but it's kind of said in some kind of like humorous way that they think, you know, isn't going to hurt your feelings, but they really do want to get their point across. And when you call them on it, they go, no, 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 I didn't mean that. I was just saying, it was a joke. It, I was being funny. 
passive-aggressive folks. Woo, they can get on my nerves. The other way, the other way of expressing your anger is through open aggression. Not passive aggression, but open aggression. Those folks, man, they come right at you. There is no filter. As soon as they feel it, the whole world needs to know about it. Certain people should not have a Twitter account. Because when they get angry, everybody knows about it. Two in the morning, three in the morning, they need to let everybody know about it. Right? Open aggression. Some of you know those kind of individuals. And they'll say to themselves and to you, I'm just being real. Yeah, you're being a real something, but... The other way of expressing anger is to not express it at all. These are the people that want to close themselves off to anger. Such a bad emotion to have. They bottle it all up. Have you been around those folks? We're always going to be the martyr. Nope, nope, nope. I'm not going to say anything. Nope, I'm not going to say anything. He hurt my feelings, but I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to be good with everything. We're going to have a good trip to Disneyland. <laughs> you been on those folks before? And here's the problem. Here's the problem with anger when it's not treated properly, when you don't handle it in a healthy way. It, it messes with your body. People have a lot of physical ailments because of not learning how to process anger. Again, if you, if you just hold it in, don't ever want to express it, talk about it, don't want to go to therapy or counseling or, or don't want to share with any friends or anything like that, it has a way of, of, of harming our bodies. The body will begin to, the, to secrete hormones of cortisol and and, and adrenaline, and, 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 and many of us will get that adrenaline rush when we're angry. The blood stops going to the, to the gut, so there's no more digestion going on. It's going to the muscles because, man, it is fight or flight. We're ready to get down. You begin to perspire a bit. And if your body goes through this over and over again, you can have a lot of issues. Some people that operate at this level constantly, untreated, never checked, never processed, will get to the point where their body doesn't even produce adrenaline in a proper way. It's so imbalanced. And then they have no capability of ever having uh, uh, the right response to stress or anxiety or, or uh, fight or flight. Their body can't even take it because it's been operating at this level for so long, it just cannot produce in a balanced way. And so I believe that David has gotten to this point. I believe he's gotten to the point where he is so stressed out, there's so much anxiety, there is so much fear that he has become angry. And this is what's driving him. And just so you know, anger is typically the second reaction. It is a secondary emotion. Typically, we get angry after we feel hurt. We get angry after we feel embarrassed. We get angry after we feel marginalized. We get angry after we feel belittled. We feel angry after we, we feel small. This is when we get angry. Anger is usually a secondary emotion. And many of us go to our anger first and focus on it without asking ourselves, why did I get angry? What was I feeling insecure about? Why was I feeling extra sensitive? All we know at this point, I believe, is that David is so angry, it doesn't matter who he's going to harm. And just in case you think, well, he was just fighting against the Philistine. Come on, pastor. Those were the enemies of the Israelites. He was covert. He was actually working on a, on a secret mission that only the CIA knew about. And, and pastor, you, you're disparaging him, but David is still a man after God's own heart. He's doing the will of the Lord. Can we read further? Chapter 28. Chapter 28, verse 1 and 2, it says, In those days the Philistines gathered their forces to fight against Israel. And Achish said to David, You must understand that you and your men will accompany me in the army. Who are the Philistines preparing to fight? Israel. King Achish says, You know you're rolling with me, right? You're going to roll with me, right? What is David's response? Then he says, he says uh, uh, David said, then you will see for yourself what your servant can do. That's his response. 
I got you. And you're going to see what I can do. You remember me with Goliath? Bring it on. Achish replied, very well, I will make you my bodyguard for just the weekend. I'll make you my bodyguard for a few months. I'll make you my bodyguard for life. David signs off on this. He's now willing to devote his entire life to serving the Philistine king. Now last week he wouldn't even harm Saul. Saul, you're the anointed. Your life is so precious. But a few more months of running for his life, Saul going back on his word, breaking his covenant with David, now has David so frustrated, so angry, and now angry with God because you selected this man to be the king. And you lied to me, God. You said that I would be the next one in line. But clearly you don't care because I've been running around for months and months and months. In fact, from the time he was anointed to this point, it's been like 15 years, and David is fed up. Can I tell you something? I don't care how good you are. I don't care how long you have been faithful. All of us have a breaking point, and all of us get to a point where we are so angry, we're willing to fight God's people, and if we could, we'd fight God himself. I can't believe you would put me in this situation, Lord. I prayed. I dedicated my life to you. And you allowed me to be in this place of turmoil. This is so unfair. I do not deserve this. I spared your servant Saul's life twice. And you still have me on the run. Anybody been there before? Oh, you too afraid to admit you're angry with God. But God knows and I know on the down low, you're angry. You can see it in those little ways, in those very passive-aggressive ways. Do you know that some of us even pray in a passive-aggressive way? Lord, if you can. Lord, if it's your will. And you may say, but pastor, that sounds holy. No, 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 no. I remember in Mark 9 when the father was passive-aggressive with Jesus. If you can, will you heal my son? And Christ came back at him. If I can. If I can, nah, bruh, if you can believe, all things are possible. Don't put that if on me. Do not use the if word with God. God knows what he's capable of doing. He knows what he has promised us. And he will be a man of his word. He will be a God of his word. We just have to continue to trust even when our eyes fail us, even when our ears fail us, even when our courage fails us, we must continue to put our trust in God. He has not given up on us. He's not turning his eyes away from us. This is the problem that Saul had. Last week I told you that Saul probably was, was probably fit to be a prophet. There's several times where the Bible talks about Saul prophesying prophesying, prophesying with prophets, which means the Holy Spirit was working in him. Even when Saul was rebellious, the Holy Spirit was continuing to work with Saul. Even when he had an evil spirit that was haunting him. Yes, it was mental health stuff, but it was also, I believe, the enemy that was attacking him. And even in these spaces, Saul was still receiving word from the Lord where he could prophesy. So even though God had given up on Saul... As king, even though God had given up on Saul being on the throne, the throne of grace never gave up on Saul. And that's critical. In fact, at the end of Saul's life, which we'll talk a little bit about next, uh, next week, it is Saul's decision to cut himself off, not God's, Saul's. And this is the way it is for anyone at the end of time, anyone who aligns himself with the enemy. It is never God's arbitrary decree that cuts the wicked off from him. He never says, you aren't good enough, so I'm done with you. It is always the wicked's choice, always their choice to not remain, to not abide. And God, as a gentleman, respects their choice. And so here is David, angry with God, now wanting to turn on his people. And let me tell you, this happens a lot in scripture. When, when mankind cannot reach God, they will find his prophets. They will find his people and they'll go off on them. Happened in Elijah, Elijah, Elisha's life 
where in, in uh, 2 Kings chapter 6 and 7, the king was so frustrated by the famine they were experiencing. They were so frustrated by the Aramean army that had laid siege to the city that the king said, may God strike me dead if I don't kill the prophet by the end of the day. David is fed up. I'm, God, you won't step in the ring, so I'll fight your people. But let me tell you something. We serve a merciful God, amen? Because the same author and patriarchs and prophets says that God sent a messenger, a, his Holy Spirit or some counselor that approached the kings of Philistia and said, do not let David fight alongside of you. In 1 Samuel chapter 29, verses 4 through 9, we read of this response from the kings, the other kings of Philistia. It says, but the Philistine commanders were angry with Achish and said, send the man back that he may return to the place you assigned him. He must not go with us into battle or he will do what? Turn against us during the fighting. Oh, you guys don't have it up there on the screen. But read it for yourselves. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 29, verses 4 through 9. It says, how better could he regain his master's favor than by taking the heads of our own men? Isn't this the David they sang about? Everybody knows this song, by the way. Isn't this the David they sang about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. So Achish called David and said to him, as surely as the Lord lives, you have been reliable. I would be pleased to have you serve with me in the army. From the day you came to me until today, I have found no fault in you. <laughs> Little did he know. <laughs> I have found no fault in you, but the rulers don't approve of you. Now turn back and go in peace. Do nothing to displease the Philistine rulers. But what have I done, David asked. What have I done? He, he is begging to fight. What have I done? What have I done? Why can I not go out and fight against the enemies of my Lord, the king? Wow. Why can I go, not go out and fight against the, the, the enemies of my Lord, my king? He's begging to get in the ring with Israel. He's preparing to fight against his own family. Can I tell you something? When anger is unchecked and untreated, you will fight anyone. You're angry with your parents. You're angry with your kids. They don't call enough. They, they're not appreciative enough. You're angry with your parents. They didn't love me enough when I was a kid. They didn't give me enough attention. You're angry with your boss. You're angry with your spouse. You're angry with the neighbors. You're angry with how long it takes at Walmart at the checkout line. You're angry with everyone. Everyone. You just want to fight. And you, and you know who those people are because it doesn't take much to set them off. It doesn't take much at all. And David is angry. Why won't you let me fight? Put me in the game, coach. I can do it. I'm, I, I'll be good. I, I'll, I'll please you. I'll serve you. Just let me fight them. King Achish answered, I know that you have been, a, been as pleasing in my eyes as an angel of God. Nevertheless, the Philistine commanders have said, he must not go up with us into battle. And here most of us thought the only mess up David had revolved around Bathsheba.com. No one likes to talk about this story. Before David became king, let me tell you something. In my opinion, before he became king, he disqualified himself. David should have been sat down. What Saul did was, was preschool stuff compared to this. Saul never joined up with the Philistines and said, hey, I'm going to fight alongside Goliath. At this point. David needs to be sat. In fact, God should have said, you know what? You little sheep herder. I plucked you out of obscurity. Anointed you, called you a, a man after my own heart, and this is what you're going to do? Boy, you better get in the ring. In fact, I don't even need Israel to fight this. I got him. 
I would have grabbed David by his ear, snatched him by his hair. I I know this is PTSD for some of y'all out there. (laughs) You remember that old school (laughs) discipline when the Switch wasn't a Nintendo video game console? (laughs) I still won't call my son the Nintendo the Switch. I'm like, nah, bruh, nah. I'm not going to say Switch. (laughs) Right? But this is the reality. If I'm God... You dead, David. You dead, dead. You and your 600 fighting men. You're out. But God in his mercy is impressing the kings of Philistia. Don't send my boy into battle. No, no, no. Don't send. That's my, that's still my boy. That's still my boy. And I know he's angry. And I know he's upset with me. And I know he's blaming me. And I know that life is so painful and so unfair that it makes even the best of us get angry and lose it a bit. I know. I've been frustrated before. Genesis 6, I'm sorry I made man. I know what it's like. He's just angry right now. And God finds a way of addressing anger. And can I tell you something right now? You do not... Address anger with more anger. Hello? You do not address anger with more anger. You do not ramp it up. Oh, you're going to come at me like that? Oh, now you all going to die. That is not the way to put out the fires of anger. It is not. And God chooses a different method. Chapter 30, David goes back to the town he was given when David and his men, in verse 3, verse 3, it says, when David and his men reached Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. Are you guys listening? Are you you reading that? They wept so hard, so, so loudly with so much of their strength that they, they were zapped of all of it. They had no more strength left to weep. There's, there's a lot of men in here who have never cried that hard. Well, when we were really young, we probably did. Where you, you cry until you fall asleep. You remember those days? Those are the best naps. Ooh, I love those. The, the, the kind of anger, that you're hyperventilating, you're crying, and you just knock out. David, grown men, the mighty men of David, they weep until they have no more strength left. Because let me tell you something. If anger is untreated, if we do not handle it the right way, it always burns things down. And it will always take us back to our primary emotion, sadness, fear. anger has now washed away and now all David can experience and feel is grief and sadness. Afraid that his family will never, he'll never see his family again. His men feeling the same way. Verse 5 says that David's two wives had been captured. So something has to happen, right? Verse 6, David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. I told you what happens, right? When you can't fight God, you fight the men of God. When you can't fight God, you'll end up fighting the church. The men are angry that God has had them in this predicament, and now they go to the, the scapegoat, the one who, who put them in this situation, and now they want to stone the future king of Israel. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But what did David finally do after 16 months? What does the Bible say he did? But David found strength in the Lord his God. Isn't that beautiful? David finds strength in the Lord his God. Oh, maybe this is when he penned Psalm 56 Verses 3 and 4, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust and I am not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? 
David finds his strength in the Lord. There, there's something about hitting rock bottom that forces us to look beyond ourselves. I know anger can make us focus. Anger can give us an adrenaline rush. Anger can make us feel powerful. But when you find your anger burning everything down in your life, loved ones that don't feel safe around you anymore, people who will never employ you again. Yes, some people, their anger issues leave them unemployable. I'm just telling you right now, sometimes it takes us hitting rock bottom before we find our strength in the Lord again. David finally said to himself, I'm not going to get even more angry. I need to empty myself. Lord, you help me out. And the Bible says that he inquires of the Lord in verse 8. And David inquired of the Lord. David, David prayed. I wonder what that phone call was like. Hey, God. Yeah. No, I didn't lose your number. I've just been angry. Hey, listen, I'm, I got an issue. For the last 16 months, um, I've been living with the Philistines, and I'm sorry, but um, I know it probably seems wrong for me to call you now that I need something, but my wife is gone, and my, and my kids, and and my men, we, we, I, I, I didn't think I had any more tears. I'm just, uh, I'm sorry. Can you help me? God never utters a word. How dare you? God never says, I told you so. God never says, fend for yourself. God never says, you know what, now you're going to call me? You don't hear any of that. David inquires the Lord, will I get my children back? Will my men get their kids back? And the Lord just answers in the affirmative, yes. Wait, what? No big kind of like, okay, all right, if you pray for the next 40 days and fast... And pay a faithful tithe. And don't miss out on Sabbath school or church. Then I'll come through for you. No. A simple yes. It's good to hear your voice. I've missed you. Yes. You'll get all of it back. Look at me. Okay. All right, all right. Oh, we're going to leave right now. I, I, I promise I'll text you later. Okay. All right. I, I love you. Okay. All right. Tell Gabriel I said hi. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. I'll see you. You hang up first. No, you hang up first. One, two, three. You didn't hang up right now? Okay. I love you. All right. Bye. They find somebody who was serving the, the, the raiders who had taken their, their families and their possessions. He had been left behind and on, while they're hot on the trail. And can I say, it's a good thing the kings sent David back when they sent him back. Had they sent him too late, he would never have been able to pick up the trail. He would not have known which direction his family went. His family might not have been alive by that time. Had he stayed in the battle, not only would he have lost his lives, but his family would have lost their lives. There's a, oh, God has some timing. If you just trust him, God has some timing and knows how to get us out of our mess if we can just trust him. So the Bible tells us that David goes after the raiders. The, 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 the young man who was left behind, the servant, tells him exactly which direction. Because he had been abused by those people. He says, oh brother, I can tell you exactly where they went. They went that way. <laughs> oh, it's getting good, it's getting good. The verse 10 tells us that 200 of David's men were too exhausted to cross the valley, but David and the other 400 continued in the pursuit. They were just exhausted. They had traveled. They had been crying. They had been weeping. They wanted their kids back. They wanted their wives back. They wanted their money back, but they were just too exhausted. David says, stay right here with the supplies. You watch the supplies. We gonna get them. The Bible says they found, they caught up with those raiders. And that they were able to get all of their wives, all of their children, all of their possessions that they had lost. They recovered everything. Can I just tell you something right now? 
when we return to the Lord, when we inquire of the Lord, when we find our strength in the Lord, do you know that he restores us of everything that we lost? Somebody say amen. Everything that we lost, everything that we lost. If I were God, I'd just give you a portion of it back because you, didn't, you weren't acting right. God says, no, I'm going to give you everything that you lost. I will restore everything back to you. This is what God even does for his enemies if they return, if they repent. He restores us of everything that we lost. The Bible calls this grace. I'm so grateful for grace. I hope you are too. But this is what's even better. Not only do they get restored of everything that they lost, they even get extra. Because now that the Raiders are gone, they don't need their cars. So David came back with more. Oh my word. What do you call that? Is that grace? I, I call it abundance, right? God wants to give us life and give it to us abundantly. This is why we trust him. And so this is what David does. And David, watch this, comes back. He comes back. He comes back. And the Bible says in verse 21, then David came back to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow him and who were left behind at, at Beser Valley. They came out to meet David and the men with him. As David and his men approached, he asked them how they were. Oh my, he sounds like a, a kind person, a new man. Verse 22 says, but all the evil men and troublemakers among David's followers said, because they did not go out with us, we will not share with them the plunder we recovered. However, each man take his wife and children and go. You guys can take your kids back. We don't want them. But no, you ain't getting any of this loot. You ain't getting any of this money because you didn't fight for it. You didn't earn it. You didn't earn it, so you don't deserve it. Aren't you so glad that we don't get what we've earned and what we deserve? Somebody say amen. Oh, man, there's going to be some people in the kingdom that did not fight the way that we fought, that did not work the way that we worked. Some people that were not in the vineyard as long as us, but the master of the vineyard said, it's my money, I get to do with it as I please, and if I want to give everybody a reward, I get to do what I want with my money. So David says, I know I'm getting a little out, I'm preaching a little bit, I'm sorry, I'm going to bring it down here. Uh, David, David says in verse 23, no, my brothers, you must not do that with what the Lord has given us. Ooh, that word, what the Lord has given us. We did not earn this, the battle is the Lord's. We did not earn this, grace brought us to this place. So we're not going to do this with what God has given us. Oh, if we could just have that mindset more in the church. My money is not my money, it's the Lord's. My talent, my gifts are not mine, they're the Lord's. He gave them to me in grace and I will share them in grace. He says, we cannot do this, it is not right. He has protected us and delivered into our hands the raiding party that came against us. Who will listen to what you say? The share of the man who stayed with the supplies is to be the same as that of him who went down into battle. All will share alike. David found a way to deal with his anger. It's called grace. David found a way to deal with his anger. It's called finding your strength in the Lord. David found a way to deal with his anger. It's called inquiring of, the God, of God, praying, connecting with him. David found a way of processing his anger. Let me tell you something. Life is unfair. Our answer, our response is grace. People have treated me unfairly. Someone called me a name. And our response is grace. Jesus Save us from the Romans and their oppression. And Jesus' response is what? Grace. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. When you can see Jesus for who he is, our reaction to unfairness, people mistreating us, us not getting what we feel like we've earned, us not receiving the accolades that we believe we deserve, I'm telling you, our response and our reaction of mercy and grace dissolves. David needed a taste of grace, and God knew he didn't need to fight fire with fire. That would have only inflamed David more. He decided to treat David's anger with 
grace and mercy. Yes. The share of the man who stayed with the supplies is to be the same of that who went down to us in battle. All will share alike. You know what David did then after that? The Bible says that he began to send more of the spoils to people in Israel. The ones he was about to fight against, the ones he had his sword and said, let me in, let me in. Now he's sending them gifts. I know some of you hunted me down. I know some of you were riding along Saul. I know some of you were hating on me, but I send you gifts. Dad, brothers, I'm sorry. I've been gone for so long, but I've been so angry. I've been so angry and cut off because of my anger and everything in my life feels like it's burning down. And I'm just, here are some gifts the Lord blessed me with and now they're yours. I just want to in grace, in grace and in mercy. I want to give them to you. Family, there's so many different ways to handle anger. I could give you a bunch of reasons and, and, and suggestions like the children's story said. I even love Daniel Tiger. I used to watch that all the time with my son and my foster daughter. She was the same age. And Daniel Tiger was told that when you're really mad, and you want to roar, take a deep breath and count to four, that, that could work. But I find that grace is far more effective. Our anger took Jesus to Calvary. It did. That's why we wanted him crucified. And Jesus took that anger. And he's attempting to do something that must be done in your life today. He wants to diffuse. He wants to, he wants to love you. He, he wants to help you. And David finally gets this. And this is why I believe he pins this. And we close on this. David pins this in Psalms 4, verses 4 through 8. Be angry, but do not sin. Be angry, but do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness, meaning doing the right thing. And put your trust in the Lord. There are many who will say, who will show us any good? You know who's going to show you good. That's right, your Savior. Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. You have put gladness in my heart more than in, more than in the season that their grain and wine increase. I will both lie down in peace and sleep. For you alone, O oh Lord, make me dwell in safety. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for reminding us again of where our anger has been taking us. We do not want to make any more excuses because anger will make us make lots of excuses. Why we're doing what we're doing, justifying what we're doing, all of this stuff. But Father, we're tired of being angry. We're tired of being angry with you, angry with the world, angry with everyone around us. And we now want to treat it. We want to treat it. And Father, though I believe that we can listen to Daniel Tiger and we can go to therapy and counseling, there's a number of things that we could be a part of a 12-step program, a number of things that we can do. I want to go to the original, the best way that you handle our anger. And that is with you wrapping your arms around us, telling us it's okay, that you forgive us and that you restore us, and you'll give us back everything that we lost. If we can just be patient... One day, all of the wounds from our childhood, all of the missteps in our life, all of the people who have harmed us, you will wipe away every, every tear. You will heal and mend every wound. You were wounded for us so that we could be healed. Thank you for taking our anger all the way to Calvary. May we begin to show grace to those we've been so angry with. Give us the heart of a champion so that we may do this in Jesus' name.